Hello everybody, this is the Promo Sale Academy in Heidelberg and my name is Rüdiger Arnold. Today I'm going to discuss an often underestimated problem in cell culture, namely contamination by mycoplasma. I'll give you an introduction to mycoplasma, show you relevant detection techniques and show you in a practical approach how easy it is to detect mycoplasma in your laboratory. This first setting shows you the control cells. They are not contaminated by mycoplasma. They have grown to a certain density and they still show signs of proliferation. Cell morphology is like it should be for epithelial cells. Compared to the cells which have been inoculated with a low dose of mycoplasma, you already see that there are fewer cells on the dish. However, these cells still proliferate and you see, and you see many mitotic cells. Now compared to the high inoculated cells with a lot of mycoplasma, you directly can see the difference in cell morphology. These cells still proliferate, but they look different. But honestly, would you ever have the chance to spot this difference without the controls aside? Probably not. So it's clear that test systems are necessary. The question remains, where do the mycoplasma come from? The next slide shows you a pie chart of the species of mycoplasma most frequently found in cell culture. Those on the left side are of human origin, so they live on human epithelia. So it's likely that the person handling the cells brought them in the culture. The other species of mycoplasma being found in cell culture are of animal origin and they might um, be from supplements which came from animals. As you see, those mycoplasm in the cell culture might possibly have just waited for the development of this technique to find their new biological niche. What are mycoplasma? They are the smallest self-reproducing prokaryotes. They fall in the family of molecules and they are in size only 0.3 to 0.8 micrometers in diameter. The genome is one-fifth of E. coli and they are very flexible in their size and uh, shape and so they can pass 0.5 micrometer filters. In addition, they are resistant towards penicillins as they don't have a cell wall. The effects on cultured cells are multiple. You saw already that cell growth and morphology is impinged. However, there's also an effect on cell viability and cell death and it can be up to 30% of cellular protein and DNA which is of mycoplasma. Of note, even high titers of mycoplasma cannot be seen uh, with a light microscope and would not lead to turbidity of your cell culture media. So it's obvious that we need test systems in order to control for mycoplasma. The first setting shows you some tests for the biochemical activity of living mycoplasma. The MPDR test uses an indicator cell line and is very time consuming. More elegant is a luminometer based test system which also uses the biochemical activity and it's in addition more sensitive. It's also possible to directly grow mycoplasma, however this is a very lengthy uh, experiment. The next set of test systems is starting with a direct detection of mycoplasma DNA by a nuclear stain like with Hoechst or DAPI. As you see from the example, this extra chromosomal DNA outside the cell can be seen, however this is only very faintly seen in the picture. That means it, needs, um, it requires some experience and the detection level is very low. Amongst the most sensitive and um, shortest tests are PCR-based test systems. These detect mycoplasma-specific genes and are done in a very elaborate fashion. 
For detection of mycoplasma by PCR, you only need a few microliters of cell culture supernatant. We subject these supernatant to a PCR reaction and run it either on a gel or have it as a quantitative PCR. Here is the result of our mycoplasma PCR. On the left you see the size marker followed by a positive and a negative control showing the respective signals either being specific for the presence of mycoplasma or only the internal control. Next are the three samples of HeLa cells. The highly contaminated sample does show a clear signal for mycoplasm, while the cells being only inoculated with a low amount of mycoplasma still shows a mycoplasma signal next to the internal control. The negative cells, so those as a control without mycoplasm, far on the right side, they only show the internal control. A more quantitative approach is a real-time PCR-based method. Here, besides the positive control, you nicely see that different titers of mycoplasm can very well be quantified. So, my recommendation for mycoplasma testing intervals are the following. Whenever you have a contamination, you have to test weekly until you do not detect any contamination anymore. If you ever have a new cell line arriving at your lab, keep it separate unless it is tested. Whenever you have problems with your reproducibility of the results or with your cellular morphology, think about testing. And as testing determines safety, a three-month interval for testing is recommended. Last not least, before ever thinking about cell banking and transferring your cells to liquid nitrogen, you have to test those. We are now at the end of our session on mycoplasma contamination. I hope I could show you that mycoplasma indeed can impinge on multiple levels of cellular activities and it's thus obvious that you have to control for mycoplasma. For further information, please refer to the scientific resources on promocell.com.